Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we take a midweek break from everything about the games in the Linux gaming and cover some of the stuff behind it that makes it work, because this week, that freaky little pocket chip, it has kind of went 3D-ish in a very strange way. Seagate's <coughs> counted to 10 terabytes. That's going to be interesting. Microsoft, uh, well, yeah, they kind of nope some Linux. And GIMP, 294, it is a thing. I'm Ben Stone. Hi, I'm Peter Mathieu. And I am Matthew Komodo. All right. Um, the thing we like to do at the beginning of every show is, you know what, just get right into it. Yes. So uh, no one picked this one, so I might as well take it. Uh, Microsoft won't let you install and boot Linux on lockdown Windows computers. Yep. The guys at Fosbytes wrote a teeny tiny article about a security exploit that was present in some Windows RT devices. And uh, what you could do with that exploit was, say, sideload an entire operating system like Linux, like any sane person would do, maybe. Uh, but Microsoft has since uh, released a new patch for uh, Windows RT 8.1 and 8, I think. Both of them have the update is MS16-094. So if you have one of those devices and you don't want to be limited to just running Windows because they're actually killing support for Windows security patches on the RT devices in 2018, and you want to load, you know, Linux, you might want to hold off on that update. Actually, I'm going to correct you with that. The <laughs> RT 8.1 will have um, incremental uh, security upgrades until 2023, like um, oh? running Windows 8.1 as totes going to be an option. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. th this is what I don't get. Microsoft is really went scorched earth policy in the RT and they're like that that never happened like what they're getting ready to do with the uh Windows phone because they're full metal with that and you know uh, here's the, what I'm thinking of let people get some actual use out of this because if they can't no no one's going to be the next year these things are use, useless let, let people tinker with them do something with them instead of throwing them in a rubbish bin which ends up in a landfill because they're not going to get recycled and they're not going to have any resale value at least if you can do something else with it you might be able to put it on craigslist and get 20 quid for it yeah well i mean the, the windows that's on it won't stop just working in a bunch of years it just won't get updated mm -hmm. but i understand what microsoft is doing here is that they want to abandon the platform they want to be done with the windows rt thing so they just lock everything up and say okay this is locked up we don't want to deal with it so well, they're not gonna and, have, and or, the, or how many people do you think that would be installing linux on an rt device or going to ring up mike redmond for support <laughs> for their rt well, I don't expect that many people to actually have an RT device to install Linux because the Linux people are not the type to buy one in the first place uh, because Linux people know better than just buying uh, Windows RT tablets. They would buy something with Android probably or something just better, less locked down. And, and um, the side loading stuff was still... Uh, a hack to begin with so yeah it, they got lucky to begin uh, in the beginning and then yeah it uh, didn't work anymore so i, don't know. I mean um, I, one of the comparisons i was thinking about is i, I was like one of the six people that bought the uh, google original google nexus 10 which was like a bazillion dollars and if it wasn't for those nexus devices being like oh yeah they're real real easy to unlock from google like google's like have at it little buddy um, because it didn't get, not even the lollipop, it didn't, uh, the, the marshmallow, nothing like that. And like, no, we're not supporting it. Why? Because we want you to buy the new Nexus. In. <laughs> that thing probably would have ended up in the trash if I couldn't have put a uh, Cyanogen Nightlies on it and continue using it, Pedro. Yeah. On the, on the Nexus, uh, seven, um, uh, using, I like it. When I tried Ubuntu on it, it was really simple. I mean, it was just a few commands, uh, really straightforward. I mean, that's the kind of the device you want. And that's, that's, uh, that works for every uh, Linux device on, in general. I mean, contrary to popular belief, Linux does not uh, run on everything. And, or, and unless you're really masochist, but uh, yeah, you you want devices that run Linux out of the box to get a good experience. 
Yeah, but that's one of the things that people always did is like you have an old PC that Windows just cannot and will not run anymore because it's really outdated hardware and it's still working. So you would like to at least, you know, put it to use or just load a free operating system so you can donate it to some charity or school or something. And you can't do that with the RTs, which kind of sucks. But then again, this is Microsoft. Did well, we really don't have to worry about else? patching hardware because somebody needed to patch their software. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the software, not so good. So you may have heard uh, late last week uh, that um, the Ubuntu forums were compromised. And if you didn't hear about it, chances are you probably went to the Ubuntu forums out of some random Google search and you saw that they were offline. Yeah. So there was a known sql injection vulnerability in the forum runner software that they were using for the ubuntu forums and they didn't patch it for some reason they don't exactly say why but they didn't patch it so a little you know enterprising young lad i'm assuming probably living in finland <laughs> that's just playing to the stereotype but uh yeah he, they got word that a user had gotten the contacts, uh, uh, had gotten the contents, not contacts, uh, of the user table, which contained usernames, email addresses, IPs, and a couple other things for the almost 2 million users of the Ubuntu forums. Kind of bad. Kind of bad. But then again, this isn't the first time this has happened. Back in July 2013, the Ubuntu forums were also hacked, and the site was actually defaced. Now, this time around, they did say that the uh, attacker was not able to gain access to any shells or anything outside of read-only access to the SQL database. So, yeah, but uh, this also brings to mind the Mint hack for a couple of months back, which... Um, that one was actually worse because they managed to compromise ISOs, pollute the repo, and they got uh, admin access to Clemente Lefebvre's account. That was pretty bad. Yeah, but the, the forums didn't um, didn't store passwords uh, because everything mm -hmm. Ubuntu uses uh, the SSO, which is single sign-on. So if you go to Launchpad, uh, they use the same authentication system. So what they got was some kind of random string, which was hash, hash and salt, but it was not the password. So they can't find the password based on, on that. That that's a good thing. Uh, so yeah, not not really any uh, sensitive info was leaked. No, That's... but there were a few things they were able to get. Um, they were still able to download portions of the user table. I mean, that had the usernames, uh, email addresses, and IP addresses for all, well, a portion of those 2 million users. So, ogre bugger, guess what? Your ISP knows a lot more than that about <laughs> yeah. you. So, bam, it's out. Yeah, we got a new release for GIMP. Uh, so it's 2.9.4. It's been in development for a, a couple of months now, or maybe even longer. And it's got a bunch of new stuff going. Uh, the most noticeable uh, change was the, a new UI um, with new icons, new dark themes. Uh, it looks very good now. I mean, I've. Finally. I ran Finally. the. the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Uh, I ran the, the development version like for months now because it, because of this um, of this theme and the, the new icons and everything. Uh, but they, it's not the only thing. They they could they got new color management uh, options. Uh, they they got new G E G L uh, plugins. Uh, you can use dark tables, uh, dark table as uh, an external tool to process raw photos. Um, you can use uh, brushes for from my paints, so that's neat because uh, my paint has some very neat uh, brushes. Uh, there is one feature that I've been waiting for more than twenty years, twenty years for real, and it is. Uh, 
style painting, so which is like you paint in a small area of the screen and it will repeat in, in a tiling pattern. And I had this in Del Deluxe Paint for on Amiga and I was looking for something similar on Linux and couldn't find it. And now they have this and like the, they have the symmetry painting and everything. Uh, and they have this tile thing, which I was looking for like, for years, for more than 20 years. And that's really cool. Um, I tried it, played around with it. I mean, it does what it says on the tin, and it's a bit beta. The one thing I didn't like, um, they changed a very flat and dark icon theme, and they effectively have been monitoring every time I use GIMP over the last 20 plus years myself. And they, <laughs> the, these are the actual icons he likes to use the most. Let's change the pictures on those because it'll be real <laughs> funny watching them from here on out because they totally did that. And it is a bit chuggalicious because debugging is enabled by default. If you've been following me on the Twitter nets or the G pluses, I, I did post a picture of it. I was like, all right, I'm just going to clone this thing and compile it from source. And it's like, well, you need all these depths, install these depths. It's like, well, you need all these other depths. And you could see the moment where I just went. Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> yep. Found PPA. Yeah, I, I used installed. to have a script to compile it as well, and it I couldn't manage to get it working. And I had the, the dependencies included in the scripts and everything, and it used to work with uh, two point eight, I think. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, I don't know what's what's going wrong here. They changed a bit because I too used to build the uh, 2.8 series from SOS and when I tried the usual methods with 2.9 it wouldn't build either but the yeah, visual update I, I think... the visual update yeah. was uh, necessary it was always something that whenever I did a fresh install or I just installed GIMP on, on an already running system uh, the one thing that I would change was the visuals. I would have to make the background darker and, you know, maybe use monochrome icons, smaller ones, because the default ones are way too big and they take up far too much real estate in the screen. So, yeah, this good idea. And, uh, and switch to single window mode as well. That's one of the things I do. <laughs> Heathen. Just, just, just burn him. All right. Uh <laughs> Shoot Master Race. What is this all about? <laughs> Dropbox did something good, you say? Yeah, Dropbox, they released a new image compression algorithm, which is supposed to compress JPEGs uh, by more than 22% on average. So, and, oh, and it's... That's what this is about. I thought it just drew a blue plus on them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> What it does, well, they explain on their blog all the technical details. I mean, yeah, I, I tried reading this, but it would just hurt my brain. <laughs> and because what's really important here is that they open sourced it. Yeah, yeah they released it with the source. Apache license. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you read their blog, they, they got the obligatory uh, reference to HBO Silicon Valley and Pipe Piper because compression company and everything. Uh, you got to go really into deep details about how this works and how they, they make it so yeah it, it, so basically game... we're going to end up with another JPEG compression algorithm and we're going to have a continuation of everyone's favorite XKCD comic about competing standards that may or may not ever mm. see the light of day in a browser question um, mark well you already maybe. can see this uh, in a browser, if you go to the Dropbox website and you try to uh, render a JPEG. Incorrect, it'll... because that would require me using Dropbox as a service. <laughs> ah, yes, <laughs> of course. But this implies that you're using Dropbox, and uh, as good as their image Loop. compression is, they'll still turn around and sell those JPEGs the first chance they get, because they actually say that in the end user license agreement. Anything you put on the Dropbox, it's theirs. They can do with it as they please, basically. Yeah, that's the same thing Facebook mm -hmm. does. But um, uh, yeah, I have counted uh, 10, 10 because Seagate's 10 terabyte Barracuda Pro is the world's largest consumer hard drive. And I know what you're saying, but 10 terabyte hard drives are a thing already. Yeah, but uh, this is consumer, consumer. And it's from Seagate. You know, Seagate, you know, the ones who are at <laughs> this moment, you know, years. worse than the old Death Star era of IBM drives. Yeah, though, that Seagate. So, yeah, do not buy one of these. <laughs> and it has a couple. I mean, listen. All right. 
pretty decent specs. I mean, it, it's a 7200 RPM drive. You know, you're thinking like 5400 RPMs like that. And it can actually do read speeds of 1.5 gigabits per second. So here's the biggest issue. Um, you know, they're saying street price is going to be around $500 for this. In an Five cents a gig-ish. When I can walk out in virtually almost every manufacturer, it has eight terabyte drives for 300 all day long. Tough sale. Yeah. Tough sale, guys. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a... You can even get NAS drives for under 250. And that's nice because I was thinking about building a new NAS. But other than that, I like how the, the drive looks. Mm. I mean, it's just like a big, solid block of metal. I mean, that's a little bit unusual for uh, hard drives. Uh, if you yeah, go and see, look at the, the bottom <laughs> view of the drive, it looks kind of neat. Yeah, it's definitely, well, I was going to say consumer uh, needs justify 10 terabytes, but then again, no, they don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, well, man, I, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of Linux ISOs that I, I, I store. <laughs> Yeah, but then again, it'll take you even for a four gigabyte one of those. Wait, wait. Um, West... uh, we do have a feedback se section, but uh, <laughs> I want everyone to send us some feedback or leave a comment in YouTube of every time you've said it'll take X before this gets filled. How many times you've said that before you had to? It was like crap. I'm out of space. And you have to get something else. <laughs> oh, I got I got my four gigabytes, uh, four terabyte filled in less than a year, mm -hmm. and now I have seven terabytes. And it yeah, but don't 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 get the Seagate drives. Uh, they <laughs> will nope before their time. And I got a Seagate drive that the latest drive I got is the Seagate. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the worst Seagate you can get, which is the three terabytes. Mm. Lovely. Well, okay, so, so I don't Just don't put anything of, on, of value on it. So yeah, next we got the, the maps, the, the maps on, on GNOME um, in particular. So one day you, you would Map open quest. That's a GNOME, name I haven't GNOME maps. in a long time. And you would just see a bunch of tiles uh, saying, yeah, you reached uh, the data limits on our service because they Spare, were using you're looking at this all wrong. This is just um, directions in hard mode, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no reference whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, so that's the interesting thing when you build free software using uh, closed services. I mean... You, you have the, the software all open source and all that's good, but you have no control over the service you use. So one day, well, it stopped working because, yeah, they, they say, nope, you don't have access to it anymore. So they're looking for an alternative to MapQuest. And obviously, you, you could think about OpenStreetMap, um, but it's against the terms of license of service mm -hmm. from OSM to use directly the tiles from their... Uh, service, which is understandable, uh, given that it's expensive to serve True. hotels. Yeah, I mean they have a limited amount. But then of, again, uh, I think Gnome's servers. big enough a to pick up a phone, call them, and like, hey, we would like to use this. Also, we'll do our own cache of your maps, and maybe we yeah. can work something out. Fortunately, this was for Gnome. And it was a map service, so it only affected 11 people. So not a great loss. <laughs> yeah, I'm just what, wondering how these... invasive uh, an agreement with Google would be, just so they could use the Google Maps tiles. Uh, I, I mean, that would be doable, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Google Maps is used in another bunch of services, uh, especially... Yeah. Um, on and Android the only and reason I can see stuff. that they're not using it is probably because they already looked at it and went like, oh, okay, so that's kind of invasive. We mm. don't want to do that. If yeah. that's the case, then yeah. But if they know, haven't man. even it's tried that, one what of those, are you like, doing? Weird things because I, I, I'm a sucker for things that work because my first thought with this is like, that's a neat project. That's a fun project. Okay, Google, how do I get to... um. Oh, yeah. And it's going to send me there. It's like, no, Google's taking all your data. I was like, I know I'm the product. 
um, but they give me free <laughs> stuff in return. That's how that relationship works. They're like, but mm-hmm. you, that's why I use DuckDuckGo. And I was like, your ISP knows everything about you, Brad. Yeah. I hate to tell you that. They're like, I never thought about it that way. And I was like, right. So you might want to let, let your little holy war die down on your privacy on, right? <laughs> so um, this has all happened before. Um, uh, it yeah. All no, the, the, that's still the, the dumb thing. There we go. Pocket. <laughs> po- 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 wow. Oh. Hang on, hang on. I, I have to swallow Oculus. self-worth and pride in order to say this. Um, Poculus Chip is now available for $49. Needs more bicycle. It, it uh, need, needs more something. <laughs> you know, the Pocket Chip, uh, what was it? Uh, I think $49 itself, which was the $9 yeah. chip with a case, LCD, touchscreen, keyboard, battery, um, deep fryer, something else. <clears throat> um, well, they have a pair of lenses that you could put on this and okay they have a pair of lenses it's slightly worse than google cardboard well this is what kind of shocked me they're like you now you can hang on let me get this quick <laughs> all your favorite homebrew virtual boy games seriously 3d in your po- see they're even alluding to it's like 3d yeah right um this is going to be i bleed uh, aneurysm inducing red Followed by Persuado 3D from the 3D Boy. And by homebrew, we mean that uh, there's a 3D Boy emulator running that runs on the chip. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's nothing like relive- uh, reliving the nostalgia of the ice rain damage inducing uh, that was the Virtual Boy back in the 90s. Um, this, I'm assuming this fairness, comes from this the... will not snap your neck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, it's true. Portable, it's not as heavy. <laughs> that That's that's true but um i can only see this coming from the relative niche success of the gear vr that samsung's vr set that you can use with the samsung phone uh thing is those phones have quad or octo core socs in them which can muster a semblance of performance to provide a passable vr theater experience the chip by itself doesn't I don't know, um, yeah. Strider. It doesn't seem like they're saying this is VR. No, uh, no, no. You have to see this as a parody because if you click on order now, <laughs> you just get the the pocket chips. Mm-hmm. That there's no nothing else. You have if you want the the actual uh, headset, you have to 3D print it yourself. So yeah, it's and just the lens? A, 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 it's a, just a the jo- a joke product, and you have to add your own lenses. You have to do you build everything by yourself. So, oh, so it's even worse. Never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they, they just missed the Virtual Boy and they just needed to make a new one. And I, mean, I guess that's a requirement to update. It this. doesn't matter. I mean, what it is, is, is it's a fun little project. I and mean, we're ribbing it yeah, because it's, it's, it's in our fun, DNA I mean, to give something a little bit of, you know, crap. But I Mir mean, should totally build one. You should... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Build one from here. Get out there. Get get your mobile with you and film them like right into traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Play Pokemon Go. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So since we are about wrapping up the arm segment of this week's show, a Japanese company called SoftBank has approached Arm, the the Arm guys, the ones that develop the architecture, to um, you know buy them. And they made an offer of 24.3 billion uh, UK pounds. That's a, around 32 billion US dollars. And yeah, SoftBank said that they are looking for someone to help them with the uh, their IoT projects. And <laughs> you, you really kind of, you got to give it to them because I can only imagine how the meeting at SoftBank went when they came to this decision. So what's the most energy efficient way to, for us to power an Internet of Things device? Xeons. Um, the, the ARM architecture, probably? Okay, so who are the biggest ARM players around? Uh, well, outside of ARM itself, you have Qualcomm and MediaTek, but those have been making a lot of money out of ARM phones. ARM doesn't make anything. ARM <laughs> license. Yeah, no. yeah. The uh, arm just licenses it, so they went like, "Okay, so let's just buy arm directly," <laughs> and they did. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't aware of a bunch of things. I mean, I I didn't know my history very well, and I 
I learned I learned that Arm was British, and they were the same guys that made the Acorn computer in mm -hmm. the 80s. And mm -hmm. the, the A in Arm stands for, well, stood for Acorn. I, mean, so, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily I think that. this is going to affect a lot of stuff, but um, with the whole Brexit thing, you know, the pound kind of went, and uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of companies oh, are look. walking in there going, <laughs> Wow, everything's 20% off. <laughs> Let's pick up a few Gee. things before we go home. Yep. All right. But I'm um, speaking of purchases. Yes, acquisitions going around. The Chinese group purchases Opera for 600 million US dollars. That's 50% off. <laughs> Scott Michaud, he likes to join us every now and again over here in chat realm. And he wrote this story for PC Per. Don't worry, you'll find the, uh, the links in the show notes. And originally, the deal was supposed to be for $1.2 billion. But it was canceled because some government authorities kind of didn't like the deal. So, well, yeah, I mean, it kind of they ramped up. They're like, oh, we got to do uh, this and paperwork. We got to do some investigations. Like, how long is that going to take? Uh, what would be too long? Uh, yeah, twice that amount of time. They went, oh, right. So how about <laughs> not selling the whole company? And what we're going to do, Brad, what we're going to do is um, just sell the browser. Do you think you could cook some of that? I was like, yeah, yeah you could do that. Um, so that's what the deal was and how yep. it went down. So. What's going to remain with Opera, you know, they're just the browser, the VPN service, their ad system, and all that other stuff is going to remain with that, which I, I was kind of curious. I was uh, like, so what, what's so going to happen with browser? the, um, I, I can talk over you. I have a much larger lung capacity. <laughs> spider, so any day you want to keep going, let's go. Um, I was really interested to see what was going to happen with a VPN service in China. Now, what were you saying, Shredder? Uh, yeah, when you say browser, does that, does that include the the mobile browser? Yes, because it that does. that that's yep. where they have a huge market share. Mm -hmm. and the Opera, I mean, it, it maybe have a one percent market share on the desktop. Well, you can remember before mobile. we had iOS and before we had Android, Opera was a beast on mobile. That was like the browser, the one that yeah, Opera Mini kicked ass. It is. Com compared uh, to what it's, it's, um, Frank's browser, <laughs> <laughs> Netscape Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the thing that happened. Uh, wish him the best. Maybe it'll be interesting to see what happens to the Opera browser in China. But we need to shill our advertisers because our advertisers yeah, again. are you. <laughs> that's right. Uh, special thanks. All the thanks to our Patreons helping us out. Kicking in $153, combining with Linux Weekly Daily Woo. Wednesdays and Linux Gamecast Weekly, available on Saturday nights. We do a bunch of things. we got a bunch of goals. Head over there and check it out. If you've ever been on the line sitting back, it's like, hey, man, I like watching this show. I want to support that. Think about it, you know, maybe maybe a quarter, quarter a week, you know, buck a month, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. That'd be great. And hey, maybe not. Share the show. Let people know about it. That's also incredibly important. We do have special rewards. If you log into Patreon right now, you're not going to see this. But if you are a $1 Patreon plus, <laughs> we do a series solid left for Brad. Don't worry. It's not behind a paywall. There is one from last week that you can watch. We hated this level. This was horrible. This <laughs> level features this guy right here getting us killed to death multiple times. And... um. <laughs> It, I'm so good not at that this by game. All. And later today, after I get the show out, we, we have some more trying again coming out. And there's a couple of other perks. Uh, we do have one goal that's coming up where uh, we're going to be getting all the people and uh, chat and static and Pedro. And we're going to be doing scheduled streams twice a week, sometimes gaming, sometimes technology. You never know what type of crazy stuff us kids will come yeah. up with. But. I'm horrible at shilling ourselves, so let's stop, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's just get onto some smash you know, rubbing. Back, baby. Do you remember um, the guys? Uh, oh, you might remember this thing. <laughs> well, what was it? The Steam Boy originally? Uh, or, yeah, I think it might have been the Steam Boy. The yeah. Steam Boy, then Va Va I was like, shut up. And they're like, okay. Um, <laughs> the original plan was to take a off the shelf x86 AMD CPU, shove it in there. Well, APU. Sorry. APU, yeah. Um, and it was going to play all your Steam games under Linux, and uh, their original Kickstarter video showed an LCD connected to some wires off screen. <laughs> They're like, see, it's <laughs> running, guys. Guess what? People aren't quite that stupid, fortunately. <laughs> 
but they're back. They're not actually asking for money this time. Instead of that, they they have a very, very poorly done uh, 3D printed prototype. Again, sitting on a bunch of random wires. Sorry, uh, (laughs) because that's what that is. Don't even have a screen there. They just got some packing foam. And... um, they say they have some outside investors. Strider, you 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 think you you looked at this picture and went, you just started throwing money at your money, didn't you? You're just like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- if the the project wants to work, it needs those investors. Uh, but it it all, all boils down to how much money they, they got. They've been saying for three years they've been working on a prototype, and they went to the investors and were like, three years, you get a prototype. 10 more weeks and we'll have it. I mean, what type of moron investors did they manage to sucker into giving them money? I don't know, but if it was Valve and it's no. a possibility. All right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you almost caused me to spit on about $2,000 worth of electronics. You watch it, buddy. <laughs> no, it's uh, very easy to say it wasn't Valve because Valve didn't even bother with the Steam machines themselves. Mm-hmm. And those yeah. had the actual branding behind it. So what kind of momentum does the Smack Z even have, assuming, and this is assuming, they are going to have another Kickstarter campaign, which, again, assuming it will be successful. That's a lot of assumptions going there. And even if they do have a successful second Kickstarter campaign and they then get some more private investors or a publisher, maybe, to actually publish everything and take all the charges mm-hmm. how i don't see this happening i mean if you get a prototype and this is all you got i mean seriously um ladies and gentlemen who are watching linux <laughs> weekly this might look like an xbox clone controller but i promise you this is the next steam machine it runs on not two but four 10 core xeon processors <laughs> now the monitor no i think uh i think i got you beat there Vin. oh oh Wow. This wow. has a no, lot more this, technology. The 12 behind core it. processors. All right. And the screen is remote. <laughs> uh, listen, we're going to be starting our Kickstarter. This is just a prototype. Don't worry about it. It's a real thing. It's going to be the best thing. So just give us money. We promise, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, I'm sorry, but right now, that is exactly what their marketing plan is. But what's up next? That's, well, up next, uh, it's Corora. Corora 24, it's a new version of the operating system. It's now out. It came with a bit of a delay because the lot behind RPM Fusion was having some issues yeah, I don't with the new... I, I like it now. It, ha- it includes XFC 4.12. We're buddies. Uh, it already had that since like 22. But <laughs> uh, they... Um... Now that the um, RPM Fusion guys have sorted the issues that were present with the Fedora 24 release, the uh, team behind Corora was actually able to release the new version. It comes with XFCE 4.12 and Cinnamon 3.0 and XF, uh, um, mm-hmm. KDE 4.6, uh, 5.6, sorry. I'm getting confused. Lots of numbers. Uh, and yeah, it's basically, if you were ever a Fuduntu fan... Corora is probably the distro you're looking at. If you want to use the KDE version, I would recommend you hold off on it right now, at least until Plasma 5.7 is available in the repos, which it shouldn't be long. Yeah, uh, so we're reviewing a, a distribution, so you know what question will I, I will ask. Is yes. do, they, do they have a script <laughs> to convert... A Fedora to to this. Also, yes. Uh, okay, so that's the, at least <laughs> that's the good point. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, for you can actually just, just turn a regular Fedora install into a Corora install. Yeah, I mean that don't, absolutely don't seems legit. The, My biggest uh, question uh, with that, especially with something like Fedora, is but if you're tinkering around with Fedora, uh, it's like, well, what's the point? Uh, um pre-installed things and I was like isn't that just like pre-packaged extra stuff I might not want I mean yeah but then again they don't really install a lot it's just the basic functionality stuff like if you install just raw fedora you don't get mp3 support you don't get well a bunch of different video codecs unless you you know use VLC like any sane person would that takes two but... possibly three commands 
Yeah, but this comes with all of those set up and it comes with RPM Fusion already set up and well, they have the Corora repo which has some packages which Fedora, neither Fedora nor RPM Fusion have in those repos. So you also get a bit more software out of the box than you would with a standard Fedora. So it saves you a bit of time. Yeah, I was looking on, on their GitHub and there is a bunch of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. there, it's not uh, like a few pre-installed packages. There, there are actually many, many uh, packages they, they build themselves. And yes. it's not a little project. No, it's it's actually been around for a while, and I know for a fact that at least one of the previous uh, Fadentu team members is contributing actively to Corora. Mike, keep on keeping That's on. That's awesome, man. For everyone at home wondering what a Fadentu is, uh, we are too. So, um, <laughs> closing this out, Lunduk and whatnot. Uh, Brian Lunduk and uh, Matt Hartley, uh, well, they've released, a, I guess this is what you would call it, a prototype. Alpha Exploratory is like, hey, do people want to watch this or not? We we don't know. And it's out there. They're going to be talking about Linuxy stuff. That's great because unlike a lot of weird... Well, not a lot because there's not a lot of Linux shows. Let's face it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's four. Outside of Jupiter Broadcasting. Right. It's us and but that's it. Definitely more the merrier. I mean, Matt's mm -hmm. been on our show a couple of times. Um, Linux... Uh, Gamecast Weekly. Now, I think it's great. Um, they got to get a lot of stuff together. They got a lot of stuff fixed, but I don't think that was the point of this episode. Now, these two jackholes <laughs> have... I, I don't know how much they're going to retract now that I've said that, because I'm just being honest. I'm not attacking anybody for the first episode because I've launched a couple of podcasts, especially video ones in my day, and I go back and watch those and go, whew, that's rough. So, um, yeah, man. You guys rock on, keep rocking on, and I look forward to it in the future. So, uh, you guys, uh, be really picky and tear apart something that was just a prototype. Go. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's one of the things I, what I wrote in the notes, I'm not going to retract anything. Probably won't get into everything because I already told both Brian and Matt on Google Plus of that specifically. But, yeah, it's, uh... When I first started, well, when I first got drafted into Linux Gamecast Weekly, by then, <laughs> I would have appreciated a lot more criticism than the one I got. Admittedly, I got a lot, but I could have used more on a number of different subjects, and I didn't. Like what? And, For what? Well, I right now, I think I got most of everything down. It's how to keep a conversation going, how to riff off of... Someone, even if you have something you that's not entirely for that, you have to develop chemistry. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the chemistry, and it's one of the points I actually you bring go, up. Your in the chemistry's group. not good because, well, guess what? It's the first episode. Yeah, that's one of the things that I said. It's uh, the conversation was a bit stilted, and but yet, that's somehow, to be expected. You made that a complaint. That's to be expected because, you know, they'll figure out their chemistry eventually. And before any of Brian's or Matt's fans get all up in my business, if I'm criticizing something, it's because I want to see it improved. And there's certainly not a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's good to, to compare it to um, something like this, this weekly show, because, yeah, it's more spontaneous. So... It's closer to, I'd say, maybe Linux tech and gaming, which is more of a discussion going on. Uh, well, maybe more structured than Linux tech and gaming. <laughs> it's not discussion, uh, it's speculation. <laughs> Pedro's like a cat, man. He can't help himself. Here. <laughs> and, uh, it looks already kind of good, but it could use uh, maybe a, a little bit of improvement there. But it's it's all right. I mean, I've I've en enjoyed uh, watch watching it. Uh, the thing is, um, Brian Nunduk is very charismatic. He has a huge presence, and that leaves very little place for um, Matt Hartley to to be there. I mean, Lundo takes pretty much all the place. Uh, so maybe some balance here would be better for the future shows. I don't I know. I think they'll get it balanced out. I mean, that's why 
They, they could have came on and um, just set themselves on fire and ran around for two minutes. And <laughs> you I'd know, been like, that would have been I would have been like, awesome. all right, first episode. Good show. Yeah. But uh, one thing I saw that, that that Duke boy, he did post. He's like, uh, who would you like to see on an upcoming episode? He posted that on the G Plus on the Twitter. So go look that up. Give him some feedback. Let him know what you think. But Pedro... People should always give feedback, especially to us. Yes, feedback, criticism, disparaging remarks about our mothers. We do not discriminate when it comes to, you know, knowing how we're doing and what you guys think we're doing. And if you'd like to, you know, drop us a line, drop us your five cents, outside of Patreon, that is. Uh, <laughs> you can also get in touch with us by leaving a comment on a video. Uh, if you see it on Facebook, track down the original post, leave a comment on that. We'll get back to you. If you see it on the G pluses or on Twitters, chances are we'll see it too. And leave a comment on YouTube, leave a comment on Patreon, or get in touch with us over on LinuxGameCast.com. Hit the contact button, fill out the form, pick feedback for uh, this show, Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, or hate mail for Linux Gamecast Weekly. And we will probably feature your comment, as it were. So, coming so. up first, uh, Sudo, uh, I was talking about the scapes. That's uh, definitely a thing. Um, with Google pushing the Chrome OS, uh, Linux is really starting to accelerate. Microsoft even updated their Skype for Linux because of Chrome OS. We just need to replace X with Waylon, new Linux. Ah, uh, Stallman will do you proud, son. Um, <laughs> we'll become a fully functional desktop OS. Uh, <laughs> What are you, uh, excuse me, will become? Huh? Uh, Because I've been using it as a daily driver since 2011. 1995. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been using it for the past 10 years as well, but that doesn't mean it's functional. I mean, and you, it's is... not like you can use it as like a multimedia production streaming. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not can, like you, you can, can do, do everything. It's not like you can use it to play games nope. or, you know, uh, provide some entertainment for the fine folks at home if you want to just share your game while you're playing it. No, you can't do that. Uh, oh, wait. Yes, you can. Hmm. No, it, it is functional. But what I read from this feedback is like, if we replace uh, X with Wayland, then Linux will just be become this perfect OS uh, that we have all been waiting for. And what Strider, I expect... if that happens, how will I attach my oscilloscope and make the X <laughs> server run on my oscilloscope? Which is totally backwards I compatible. I it, it, it will work. <laughs> what, what I expect when uh, Wayland ships, and that's going, not going to be soon, is that we're going to have a big mess of stuff not working or working in unpredictable ways, like maybe legacy games not not working properly. I want to stop uh, you right there just for a second. But don't you think it has been, because we've been hearing about Wayland for what, like six years. We need to bite that bullet and we need and get it over with we we need to quit going but it's going to be probably just like all right first, first bring the problems let's do it let's get it done and and then there's well when we have this it's going to be a mess mm -hmm. okay and then it, there's a, this display server issue but there are so many more and there's so many broken stuff i did i see broken software every day there is so many stuff to improve i mean it's i consider linux to be the very best desktop there is. It's better than Windows. It's better than OS X. But it's not because it's the best that is good. <laughs> it's not because it's the best that it's better. No, <laughs> that's a bit redundant. It's good. Strider. <laughs> I don't know, man. That was that was a pretty zen, um, like learning you just threw into my brain there, Strider. I can't argue with that. But coming up next, right. Pedro. Up next, uh, Eric. He asks, uh, the last time I put it, or he says, the last time I put a computer together, I didn't even need a screwdriver. That blew me away. Someone needs to put together a 486 system and want to play CD music. Yep, been there. <laughs> yeah, no, that is very simple. I mean, you just need to, to find the cable and plug it on your Atapi CD-ROM onto your ISA, ISA sound card. And yeah, you should get sound, or you can also plug speakers onto your CD-ROM drive, and you have that mm -hmm. volume numb 
on your and a button to, to skip to the next. Oh, track. look at Mr. Fancy Man. I got my PC. Drive what operating right system are you running that on again? <laughs> Uh, back then, that would have been Windows 95. DOS. 311. 486, that was Windows 311. Uh, no, that was DOS 6.2. I used to run Amiga OS back in those days. I don't know, man. I mean, it's kind of strange. You see a lot of people, I mean, it's like, yeah, that, that's what. This is how you know you're getting old. All right. This, this is how you know you're getting old because. <laughs> When your first thought is like, well, back in my day, because <laughs> that's a, you're effectively telling the teenagers now to get off your lawn when they're on our PC mastery showing off their new build with their yellow swag and the neon lights and all that. And saying they have 32 gigs of embedded RAM in their CPU. And what you should be saying is, <laughs> listen, we, we know it's easier and it's basically assembling Legos that you can't really put in the wrong slot these days. But it's still yeah. good to see kids interesting in building stuff. It doesn't matter if it's easier. They're still doing it and continuing the tradition. Yeah. But yeah. They don't have um, COM ports, Nier Q things. Uh, they, they don't know what a dip switch is. Lord <laughs> yeah, help them. I, I they enjoy would... that. I mean, I appreciate that, that it's much easier and we do have to deal with less of that. S oh, no, no. Yeah. It's, it's great. Uh, the first. Uh, uh, what do you plug and pray card I ever had was my 3D effects uh, pass through accelerator. I plugged that thing in going, that's not going to, oh, it worked. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this all comes from the story we had uh, last week from motherboard.vice.com about PC gaming still being too hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, kids these days, well, they have it easy. <laughs> You're just getting old, man. You've changed. I'm 30. I am 30. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for everyone for showing up. Thanks to our Patreons for funding this and making this possible. We owe you all the things. Um, we will be back next week. Pedro and I will return Saturday for yes. just straight up pure gaming nonsense and rhetoric. I've been Vince Stone. I have been Vidor Mateos. And I am Matthew Commando. Bye.